here, when we think about the plagues, right? Last, we went over the first four plagues, um, and, and they had three main reasons, right? The first reason was to free Israel, right? Because they were not being treated well in this land of Egypt. And just as God had promised to Abraham, these things were going to happen to them, and then he was going to bring them back into the land. They were going to be under um, heavy, heavy uh, laden burdens, and, and, and they were under, in Egypt. So he's going to free Israel. The second thing he's going to do is to punish is, uh, Egypt for the way they treated Israel in the land. And then the third is to show the foolishness of idolatry. And, and, and as he takes his people out of the land, they're leaving really with this strong impression that Yahweh is for real, that Yahweh alone is God, and Yahweh is most powerful. And all the idols are what? Just, just nothing. They're just a bunch of nothing. <clears throat> and so, so in that, um, so in these 80 gods of Egypt, each of these plagues will address a certain amount of their gods and, and, and affect them in that way. But the biggest one that they had, the one that was most important to them, was Pharaoh himself. And that's why, if you remember, when it started out, he takes his staff, right, and God changes it into a snake, which would be kind of odd and such, unless you what, had some guy with a big headdress that looks like a snake, right? And Pharaoh's, you know, big cobra-looking thing right there, the first thing um, God does is show that he, he can make a, a snake from a rod, right? And then the magicians kind of duplicate, right? They can duplicate, they can imitate, but they cannot stop it. And so they all throw down their rods, the snakes are running around, Aaron's rod, what, eats them all up and such. And, and that begins this challenge with Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's the main guy of the system. And so it's, it's a direct threat to Thera, uh, Pharaoh. Now these things kind of, the characteristics of the plagues, they intensify as they go, right? It, it gets more and more and more, right? It reveals prediction that God's going to say it's going to happen tomorrow or it's going to happen at this time, you know? You, tame, you name the time, Pharaoh, you're right? So we saw those kind of going down. Um, discrimination, he's going to show that, that he, he will d discriminate or segregate the reality of, from the Jews and the Egyptians, right? Which they had already done. The Egyptians did not like anything Jewish, anything Hebrew they, was an abomination to them. And so God says, well, I could do that too. Let me just take my people and I'll just let it happen to yours. Um, order, the orderliness, as, the, as it goes on, it gets more... Um, it grows bigger and bigger each time and effectively wipes out and destroys Egypt. And then fifth, teaches moral lessons, lessons on the reality of false gods versus true, the true God. Now, the order of the plagues, we have three sets of three, right? And, and, and so we went over the first four, so we're actually in the second part of the second set. But, the, but basically, those, threes, those three sets of threes and then the final grand finale, uh, it goes with the two first two of those sets. One comes with a warning, right? You know, and then, and then without warning, right? And so, so it's going to happen over and over again. And so the first two, Moses give, gives the warning, one in the, the first one in the morning, the second one, and then, the, um, and then it just comes. And so the first three come with opposition, right? Remember, they're, the magicians are doing their thing, you know? And then all of a sudden, they're like, this is the finger of God. And so we've kind of saw that. So all of these next ones, now it seems like Pharaoh, as he's been hardening his heart, hardening his heart, he's gotten to this place now where he's just hard, you know? And, and, and so, um, so they kind of get, it gets into this place, and then it grows in severity, severity. So we've seen the loathsome ones. We've started with the painful ones, right? And then we're going to get to the grievous ones. And so this takes place over six months. And so let's go ahead and pick up, right? So we've seen the, the plague of the blood, where the water turns into blood, which is, again, we'll see uh, in the book of Revelation. And you see the, the second plague is the frogs, Right? and the crazy frogs and all that happened there. And then we also saw the third plague, which was the lice or the mixture of little bugs. And then um, the fourth plague was the flies. And so now we're gonna be picking up in chapter nine, the fifth plague, dealing with the Egyptian, the, the livestock. And so let's pray and we'll get in. Father, we just thank you again for your word. Lord, will you just help us tonight, Lord, as we study and, um, 
Lord, as we remember the plagues, Lord, it, it has to do with dealing with open rebellion. And, and the only thing it seems that you deal, do to open rebellion is bring judgment or chastening. And so, Lord, just, Lord, as Pharaoh is in open disobedience and open rejection of your authority and who you are, Lord, that rebellious spirit, Lord, Lord, you are going to judge and deal with accordingly. And so, Lord, just help us, Lord, to recognize, Lord, if we ever have a rebellious spirit, Lord, that you would deal with, know, know that, that, that you deal with us as kids, and, and you're going to straighten us out. And so we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So in verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh and tell him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field, on your horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, and on the sheep. A very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of, the, of Israel and of the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Then the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the L Lord will do this th thing in the land. And so you've got to keep in mind, right? Pharaoh is, has Israel in his possession. God says, let my people go, right? That they might serve me. And Pharaoh's resistance is opposing God. He's made himself God, right? He is his own God. He's the God of Egypt. He's the God of all their gods, in a sense. And so, so there's this power struggle going on in this sense. And, and yet, he wants his people so that they might serve him. When we think about service and worship, right, we all understand that we we have a tendency towards that. I, I learned that pretty quick coming out of the world. Like I was raised a certain denomination or whatever, but I was raised Christian. But for me, it was this very religious act, but a very confusing theology. And, and so as I got to it, I just started rebelling. Small rebellions, bigger rebellions, ultimate rebellions, right? And once I got into the ultimate rebellion, I was pretty lost and pretty broken because I found out the things that was trying to protect me from were the things that I really was going after. I thought it was keeping me from things, but it was trying to protect me, right? And, and, and that's what, you know, structure and restrictions do is they're trying to keep you from something, right? And we think it's from fun, but ultimately it was from myself and self-destruction. When I got to that place, I, I remember going to big places. You know, when you kind of throw off worship, you know, and, and relationship with God, you kind of get out there and you recognize things in the world, right? And the things in the world are very powerful. And the, and the kids of my age, you know, they were, we, we were going to concerts and such. Remember the the early 90s, you know, if you remember, and the concerts that they used to have and the big dust balls and different things, d depending where you were at. I was in Hawaii going to concerts and recognizing that there was a lot of worship going on at these concerts. Very similar to like what would happen at big congregations at churches. People had their hands raised, they were closing their eyes, singing along. It, it, it looked like a worship concert. And and over time, I kind of recognized, and I was trying to change my life back and try to get right with God, and I was coming to him through the scriptures, which was better theology than I had growing up, but I was still confused about certain things. And as I went through these concerts and kind of all of a sudden, I realized that this was kind of the world's church, <laughs> and they're out there worshiping, and the, and the guys on the stage, they were not just worshiping along with them, they were receiving worship. And it was really weird. And so this thing that was taking place, and I remember one time, and the guys were singing this song, and, and it was saying, we're the people that are going to hell. And that was the last secular concert that I went to because I realized I was at the wrong church. <laughs> you know, like, I was, going, I was hanging out with the world that was going a certain direction. We have it in us, a need to worship. Right? And there's certain things in this world that needs us to worship. 
And, they'll, and, and they're selling, they're, they're wanting you to come and participate in this worship. But God doesn't need us to worship. But he knows our need. Right? He gets it better than we do. And therefore, he knows that we are going to serve something or somebody. But the only one worthy of that, the only one that's going to be beneficial in our lives is if we worship him. And as Israel was serving in Egypt in bondage, right, they needed to come out where God would give them the right restrictions that they could serve in freedom. He was going to set them free, right? Let my people go, free them so that they might serve me. And Pharaoh was holding them back from what God was wanting them to do. And so he wanted to be God over them rather than have this Yahweh do that. And so... If you don't let my people go, what's going to happen? The hand of the Lord will be on your livestock, right? All the different types of animals and such. And, and he says, but there's going to be a dis distinction. There's going to be a difference. And in this distinction, the livestock of Israel will not be harmed, just the Egyptians. So he, he points this out to them. Now in verse 6, it says, so the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died but of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not even one of the livestock of the Israelites were dead, was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. And so even with the warning and even with the explanation, Pharaoh's like, not going to happen. So as I told you last week, each one of these affects part of their religious system, right? And what was their religious system affected in this time? Well, the Apis bull. They worshiped the god of the Apis bull. And, 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 and the Apis bull, like literally, it was one of the animals, and they always kept them outside. And, and, and it represented the god uh, Ptah, uh, P-T-A-H. And the bull is always kept outside. Thus, when, when things went down, right, these, all these bulls were killed, and all of a sudden, it's affected their god. Um, Menevis, the god, uh, was for the god Re and, and Ra, and, and, and this god too was affected. Hathor was the body of a woman, the head of the cow. Now, this is funny. She was the goddess of love, right? This cow-headed god, right? And, and she was the god of beauty, love, and joy. Cows. It's just, uh, don't you like other cultures? They kind of make you just wonder, you know? And yet at the same time, if you came out of a ranching community and stuff like that, the language that certain ranchers use about their wives and about, you know, well, my wife's calving next week and like, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just a thing, I don't know. Well, obviously this, the cattle god, right? She's a beauty and love and all this with her cow-headed head and, and, and woman body, this goddess was obviously affected. And then Canom, the ram god, because they, though they kept sheep and they didn't like sheep, they really liked wool. Six played. Look at verse 8. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take for yourselves a handful of ashes from a furnace and let Moses scatter it towards the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh, and it will be come uh, fine dust in all the land of Egypt, and it will cause boils to break out and sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. And so think of the little furnaces that they built, they burned their bricks in, right? The ashes from their hard labor, you know? Um, and they would take these and they would, these fine boils, they would just toss the fine dust up and boils would happen, right? Boils would come upon them. Now, you know what a boil is, right? Like, boils, you know, it's like a zit, but bigger and nastier. It's intense. And if you've ever had, like, a, a serious type of boil, they're not fun. It's an infection, a skin infection. Um, I, I once had a, um, it was out of stupidity and hard-headedness. I um, busted my chin open trying to play football in my uh, on Kauai, uh, a semi-pro team buddy of mine talked me into playing, cut my chin open. Didn't think nothing of it. Three hours later, I went in and got it stitched up. I waited three hours. Three hours is too long. Within not long, my nose looked like Rudolph. So like within a week, I had a nose like Rudolph. It, it, and it was like a boil type thing. And they put me on these heavy antibiotics and 
and my nose shrunk back to normal. It was great. It was really fun. And then um, I remember I was dating Cassandra, and I was picking on just, you know, I had a sore. I was just picking on it, you know, and, and she's like, you shouldn't pick that. It'll get infected. You know, woman, don't tell me my business. You know, that's how men are and stuff. And sure enough, after that week, I was pouring concrete, and I got this boil. It was this big, nasty thing, you know. And then all of a sudden, I started feeling sick and fainty and feverish. And I was like, oh, this is not so good. So I go to the doctors, and they're like, yeah, that's a boil. That's probably a, you have a staph infection, dude. You've got to figure this thing out so you don't end up in the hospital you know, for a week. So I couldn't play football anymore. God shut that down for me. But it was a really gnarly, gnarly, nasty thing. And with a little warm cloth and warm water, you know what happens with boils. They, you know, unless you have to lance them. But I didn't have to lance mine. It just gave up the, the pus. So now I got all your attention and excitement, right? <clears throat> Think of Job, right? Remember Job? It didn't go so well for Job, right? He found himself in a predicament, right, where God was what? Revealing himself to angels. And he was showing his relationship with mankind, and it was this weird situation, right? And the Satan of Job comes to God, the adversary, the accuser, and he says, hey, you know, let me take away Job's stuff, and surely he will curse you, right? Because God was, like, bragging on Job, you know, and Job was offering his sacrifices daily, and he was just a righteous dude in the sense that he had faith in God for covering of sin through sacrifice. And, and finally, so God allows him to be tested, loses his family in one day, loses his riches in one day. All he's got left is a wife, and she's, like, not very nice, right? Maybe she was of the worship of whatever her name was, the goddess of Hathor. I don't know. But she was really gnarly, curse God and die kind of stuff. You know, and naked I've come into this world, naked I shall go out. That's what, you know, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Job, you're awesome. That's great, right? And so the Satan shows up back and says, well, how'd it go with Job? And he says, well, you know if skin for skin. If you, if you affect his body, right, then he'll go down. Like, that's the, the thing. He will surely curse you. And so the Lord says, everything but his life is within your hand. Notice God allows certain things to go down, right? But this adversary had to get permission, right? So nothing happens outside of the sovereignty of God, but at the same time, he allowed this testing of Job. And Job ends up with these boils that are all over him, right? And, it just, and he's scraping them with like ceramic tiles, you know? Like he's scraping the the nasty things off, and complete pain, and just misery. I couldn't imagine just that kind of thing. Well, boils are nasty. Boils are awful. Now, Job survives, right? His, 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 his trial, though he has to, what, shut his mouth that he didn't justify God. Rather, he tried to justify himself, and the lesson goes is he endured uh, without cursing God, so God faithfully blessed him, and it was better you know, and so James says we love Job's endurance because in the end, God wanted to bless him double, right? Anyways, these boils, right? So I'm just going to take these little ashes from the furnace, right? In verse 10, it says, Then they took the ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses scattered them towards heaven, and they caused boils that break out and sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians and on all of the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. And so we have this, again, nasty, horrible thing. They just take those ashes, and next thing you know, everybody's got boils. And the Egyptians were really into, like, like, they're like Americans. Like, they wanted to be clean all the time, take a shower every day, you know, shave off. They're like, they were like bodybuilders who have to shave all their hair off and stuff. They were kind of into that kind of thing. And so skin blemishes and things like that were not there. That was like the worst thing that could ever happen to some of these guys. And they're, they were probably freaking out. Yet, notice the Lord hardened 
the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not hate him just as the Lord has spoken. And last week we talked a little bit about the hardening factor, that when truth and revelation is revealed, it, has a, it, ha, it affects, right? It is either going to soften or it's going to harden. It's going to take what is there and it will reveal it. So if someone is willing to what, humble themselves, right, when revelation comes, right, God will respond that way. If someone what, hardens to it, right, God will allow that hardening to take place. It's, it's dependent upon, you know, this outward revelation, what it does, what I choose in response. My response is very important. We have guys like King Manasseh. Have you ever heard of King Manasseh? The dude was awful. He was one of the worst kings of Judah ever. The guy was just so much so that all the things that he did leading the nation sent the nation into judgment. But guess what happened? In a confrontation towards the end of his life, he broke, and he softened, and he repented, and the Lord received him, and we'll see Manasseh in heaven. Now, the nation was messed up, but he was willing to soften. And so I, I don't believe any, it's necessarily too late, but, but for some people, they think, well, I'll just wait, I'll just wait, I'll just wait, right? But when you start to resist revelation, what happens? You have to harden your heart to the truth. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And now from this process, now it says that the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he didn't heed them. So now, what Egyptian gods were affected by the plague of boils? Well, Sekhmet, S-E-K-H-M-E-T, the goddess, woman body, uh, and a head of a lioness. She was the goddess of epidemic, epidemic, uh, what is it? can't say it, like an epidemiology, <laughs> I don't know, um, you know, like when the, the boils would come on or come off, right, she was in charge of all that, right, and, and such, so obviously she didn't have any control, Serapis uh, was the god of healing, and Imhotep was the goddess, god of medicine, and so all these gods, the gods who uh, dealt with infections and, you know, the medicine gods that they had, now, we have here in the seventh plague, hail. It's good to get out of the boils, right? Just in time for the hailstorm. In 13, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you, that my name may be declared to, in all the earth. As yet you exalt yourself against my people in that you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause, a very, uh, cause very he heavy hail to rain down, such as not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, sin now and gather your flock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down uh, on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. So, in this section, this is the first of these, these next three, right? Seven, eight, and nine. And the warning is given in the morning. And the warning was that the Lord God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may serve me, right? And then, and then he says, for at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart. So this is an interesting thing. He's because I'm going to send them to your very heart, so the severity of the plagues has increased, right? The, it's not just pain plagues. It's not just loathsome plagues. Now it's getting to the severity. Like now it's going, I'm going to deal with you. And he says, at this point, I could have judged you already. I could have just wiped you out with pestilence, right? Having judged them, he could have already done that. Yeah, he says, I have some purposes <laughs> to use your hard heart, right? 
And I'm going to continue this with these plagues, but I really want to reveal myself, right? I'm, I'm going to do these purposes. And what are these purposes? Um, well, number one, to, he, he sent this to their hearts. Like he wanted to sh- reveal himself in the heart that he, he may know uh, that there is none like him on all the earth. Like who else can do this, right? The third thing is that they, I might show my power in you. Speaking of in Egypt, right? The children of Israel always looked back to Egypt. They always looked back to this great event, right? Like we look back to Jesus and the apostles and all the things that went down, right? The resurrection, the miracles, like the craziness that took place and changed the world that what? Our calendars are now based off of Jesus' coming, right? And his followers and what, how it changed the whole world. They looked to the Exodus in the same way because of what happened in Egypt God showed his power, and that his name may be declared in all the earth. God really has purposes, and he started way back, right? He's picked up Abraham and started moving and says, blessing, I will bless them, right? Those who curse you, I will what? Curse them. Anyone who came against God's people and elect, what was Egypt doing? They weren't letting them multiply. They were cutting off their children, right? They were putting them in bondage. They were, what, cursing them? And so now judgment's on the, on the rain. Open rebellion's gonna only leaves God with one response, judgment. And so, so in that, now for God's people, it's chastisement. There's a difference between judgment and chastisement. Judgment is to God's enemies. Chastisement has to do with God's kids, Right? And this is what's different between the tribulation period that's coming on the world and, the, and these plagues that are happening then, right? Some people will look at the plagues and try to see it as a type of the tribulation to come. Well, there's things, similar things, right? One of them is going to be hail, right? Coming down from heaven, raining down, right? One of them is that all the waters of the world will turn to blood, right? These are some big things. They're very similar in miraculous power, but the distinction and the difference is this, is one was judgment period, right, against the Egyptians, but yet what? To, to let his people go. In the tribulation, it will be judgment upon who? Upon the wicked ones, those who are wicked and wicked ones, but ultimately it'll be chastisement against his people that they would turn back to him. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble, right? The, the breaking of the power of the strong people, right? The tribulation is to what? Turn his people back to him using these wicked ones, and then he'll judge the wicked ones in front of them and save a remnant of his people. And so it does have some comparisons. So anyways, in this warning of this first plague of the third set, Moses warns him, tells him, he's got purposes. He could have wiped you out, but he's got purposes in this. And, but this is what's going to happen. Your li- your, the livestock are going to be wiped out. And uh, I mean, with the hail, right? What does it say there? Um, verse 18, Behold, tomorrow at this time I will cause a heavy hail to rain down, such as not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, send and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. Notice the difference on this plague. It's presented with options. If you will listen to the word and move your people out of the field and keep the people from working out there, it won't affect them. But if not, they're going to they're gonna die. Well, and he says, it's, when is it going to happen? Tomorrow at this time. Verse 20. And he feared the word of the Lord among the servants, and Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. So he who feared the word of Yahweh, he who feared the word of Yahweh, right? What happened? They listened. They obeyed. They were wise, Right? Notice, you don't have to be a Christian to obey the word of God. Did you know that? 
There's wisdom in tr following truth, right? But there's also what? Foolishness in not following truth. This is the danger to equate obedience with faith, right? A lot of religious people are out there. They've listened to the word of God and it's really blessed their lives because they've lived in wisdom. The danger is, is they think they're saved because they equated following wise words and using it to help their lives rather than letting it affect their heart. Faith is believing and trusting in the promise and the character of the promise maker, right? But anybody can walk in obedience and receive from that wisdom because it's shown here. Now, if one disregards the word, it makes that one a fool. It makes them unwise, right? And so when we think of the word of God, the word of God is true and powerful, right? What's crazy to me is to think that people of faith, God's kids, don't take into account the word of God into their lives. Now, I don't have to tell you guys. You guys are here on a Wednesday night studying, you know. You guys believe in the word of God. But there are Christians who think, I got a ticket to heaven. I don't really need wisdom in my life so much. And it breaks my heart to watch people stumble over and over again in foolishness. In verse 22, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, and there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, on every herb of the field, throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, uh, um, sorry, so there was hail and fire mingled with the hail so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck through the whole land of Egypt and it was in the field, both man and beast, and hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. So you, have you ever, like, people from Oklahoma and stuff, like, those people know what hail is. It's like the big, giant rocks that hit their cars, and it's a big thing to get insurance for your cars for that purpose and such, because it's probably going to happen at some time in your life if you live, you know, out that way. You know, and, but... In the book of Revelation, it equates the idea that when the hail that's going to come down, it's going to be like 180-pound hailstones. It's kind of like big rocks, right? These guys are, the hail that was going to come down, they've never seen anything like this, right? Hail and fire coming down from heaven. That would be a little bit what? That would be intense, scary, right? And what if you were the people that said, ah, it's just Yahweh, Moses, it's just those Hebrews, you know? And all of a sudden, a big mess. Yet there would probably be a large group of people that have been watching the plagues going, whew, I'm really glad I listened to that dude, <laughs> you know? That Hebrew knew what he was talking about. He's a good weatherman. But again, all of that goes down, yet the distinction made for what? God's people in Goshen are separated out, right? Who's suffering now, right? Those who disregard the word of God. In verse 27, And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord that there may, uh, may be no, uh, no more mighty thundering and hail, for it's enough. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. So Pharaoh seems to make a confession, right? These are good words from Pharaoh. I have sinned, right? The Lord is righteous, right? We are wicked. I'm wicked. The people are wicked in Egypt, right? It's a profession, but I don't think it's a true confession, and he's like, well, if you just pray for us, then we'll let you go. Deal? Right? In verse 29, it says, So Moses said to him, As soon as I have 
gone out of the city. I will spread out my hands to the Lord, and thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, that you may know that the Lord, the earth is the Lord's. Notice there, he wants them to know who what? The earth belongs to not Pharaoh, but the earth is Yahweh's, it's the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not, uh, you will not yet fear the Lord God. You could say pretty words, but I know in your heart it's untrue. You don't believe what you're saying. Moses has got it figured out now. He, he trusts in what the Lord had said. The Lord said that Pharaoh will not relent. He will not let the people go. But when he lets them go, you'll know because he'll be driving you out. He wasn't driving them out. He trusted in what God had said beforehand. And now he's just like, yeah, whatever, Pharaoh, right? Verse 31, now the flax and the barley were struck for the barley was in the, in the head and the flax was in the bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck for they were our late crops. Notice the little agricultural report, you know? Earlier, I think it was like January, February in Egypt is when the early flax and barley, that's when they came up. Later on, about eight weeks later, the wheat and the spelt will, will come. And so that was just kind of the thing. So what happened was is some of the crops were ruined by this hailstorm, but some were not, right? So there's, and this will be important later on. And verse 33 says, so Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hand to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hail ceased and the rain was not poured on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more. And he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. It's a tough resistant one, isn't he? It's getting tougher, though, to be resistant. So Pharaoh hardens his heart, right? He and his servants, they wouldn't let him go. What were the Egyptian gods affected by the hail? Well, Shu, the sky god, Nut, the sky goddess, Seth, the ag agricultural god, and Isis, the agricultural goddess, right? So all the things that they were worshiping, Yahweh has control and is bigger and badder than all of them. See, it, it's, it, it's foolishness, right, to put faith in the farmer's almanac. Now, I used to tease my dad all the time. He'd read that thing. And I'd say, there's, there's no prediction that you think. The eighth plague, the locusts. Now the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants that I might show the signs of mine before him and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt, my signs which I have done among them that you may know that I am the Lord. So notice the purpose of God for hardening his heart to show his son, he's gonna show signs, right? And so Moses, like, all these things are going down so that, that Moses would, what, receive them, tell his sons about them, and tell his grandchildren about them, right? God wants them to rehearse these things that happened, that they might know that he's Yahweh. When you study the Bible, I don't know, it doesn't take long. You get into the book of Judges, and you're just going, like, what happened, right? Right? God was mighty. He did such great things, you know? And they're like disobeying and being knuckleheads and doing idolatry. Or, and then God raises up an enemy against them. And then what happens? Well, they turn and they repent. And they go, oh, how could we forsake Yahweh, right? The one who delivered us from Egypt. And they turn back to God and God raises up a judge to deliver them and such. Well, they needed to know Yahweh. They needed to know how mighty he was because people forget. But they were supposed to pass it forward. They needed to know that he was Yahweh, right? And remember what Yahweh, he's the covenant keeper, right? He's the one that keeps his covenant. And that's what's important to us about this story is that throughout this situation, that God is a covenant keeper, that he is going to be faithful to what he's promised. And I think every day we have to remember that Jesus, the one who made a covenant with us, right? You know, that we were grafted into the new covenant. He's a covenant keeper. He's going to come back. 
He's going to give us eternal life. We're going to get new bodies, right? All the things that he promised is going to happen, right? But we have to remember that what? He did miracles. He, he did something great for us. Now, the thing about miraculous signs, I don't know. Some people think everything is a miracle. Have you ever met somebody like that? I lost $5, in the, and then my wife found it in the washer. Hallelujah, it's a miracle. Hallelujah, you got a great wife that she didn't just put in her pocket. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, if everything's a miracle, guess what? There's no miracles. Right? In the scriptures, it's pretty clear. In Moses' time, miracles happened all the time. Right? In Elijah and Elisha's time, miracles happened all the time. Like, like true, marvelous miracles, like ones that just blow your mind. In Jesus' time, miracles happened all the time. Right? And it's not that miracles don't happen today. It's not that they, they don't or can't happen today. But if miracles happen every day, then there's nothing such as a miracle. And it always drives me crazy when things are super normal. God's providence. Yeah, God's involved in his wisdom and sovereignty, and he brings that together for you. Wow, my wife found my five bucks or what it, you know, whatever it is. But to run around saying, miracle, miracle, miracle. That means there are no miracles. Just every day's a miracle, then no day's a miracle. Because there are crazy things coming, radical things that are going to happen, right? And the world needs to understand there's something coming, and it's real. So when it does happen, they can recognize the signs. And so, so now, these are some heavy signs that are being given, and they have their purpose. They're supposed to be handed down so that they would learn, right? Uh, we're going to be celebrating the greatest miracle that's ever happened. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Right? It's radical, right? And what I think is the miracles that happen today that's, that's greater. Now listen, I believe in healings. I believe in all those things. So don't get me wrong. But the greatest miracle that happens is when someone gets born again. Someone's going this direction, turns around, and is walking to Jesus. Changed life like that, like transformed, new life. Turn with me real quick. I want to go to Revelation 11 real quick. Revelation 11, look at verse 3. It says this. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. That's interesting. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. <laughs> Could you imagine? Like, that'd be quite the preaching gift, right? Anybody came at you? <laughs> you know? And it's not like goofy guys on TVs going, <laughs> you know, just and making the microphone all dirty from their spit, right? Like, fire is going to destroy. Like, they're going to be protected by this wild, miraculous reality. In verse 6, it says, These have powers, power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in their days in the prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and strike the earth with plagues as often as they desire. See, this is similar to what? Elijah and Elisha, similar to Moses, right? And when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Uh-oh, that doesn't look good. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. 
Then those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So that's kind of wild, right? They're, they're dead and everybody just has this big party, right? And then in verse 11, it says, Now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid. And they gave glory to God, uh, to the God of heaven. And the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So, that's pretty wild. <laughs> Miraculous, right? Old Testament, we see it there. Moses, Elijah, and those guys. Jesus, and when they come, Jesus comes, but he comes how? Healing, restoring, right? Setting captives free, freeing the demonic, right? He's doing specific works that testify and are signs of his message and his person. In the future, now this is what bugs me about people that think Revelation already happened. I don't think that already happened. We would know about that, I think, in history. I think that would be one that was written down. But this is intense, right? This is something that's going to happen. And the purpose of miracles, right, is to definitely cause people to what? To, to give glory to God in heaven, right? To glorify him and to testify of the truth that they're saying. Now, it's just interesting. When we think of miracles, you know, it's not everything's a miracle, right? You guys agree? But some things are. There are miracles that happen. Just not super normative like that. Now, in verse 3, it says, So Moses and Aaron came in to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me, or else. I like to put it right there, right? Or else. If you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory and they shall cover the face of the earth so that no one will be able to see the earth and they shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail. And they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. They shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor uh, your father's fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth uh, to this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. So he warned them, right? He said, how long are you going to refuse to humble yourself before me? Remember, yeah, it's dealing with idolatry. Yes, it's judging the Egyptians. And yes, it's freeing Israel. But it's really dealing with Pharaoh and his pride. And so, throughout this time, Pharaoh has to understand he's going to lose what was left over. Remember, the wheat and the spelt came a little later, right? The trees were broken but not destroyed from the hail, right? There was still a little bit of cattle and stuff. Well, guess what's coming? The locusts are coming. The locusts are coming, right? <laughs> Have you ever seen, like, on TV, the locust storms? Remember in 2020, when it was all crazy, and then all of a sudden we heard about these crazy locust storms? It's like, oh, no. It's kind of freaky, right? It makes you kind of go, wow. That, too, is also in the book of Revelation. Now, verse 7, though, it says, Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not know that Egypt is destroyed? Have you taken a walk lately, Pharaoh? <laughs> right? I was listening to an old message, and, and the preacher was talking about when George Bush, George W. Bush, right, right after he went out of office, and everybody was 
swanning over him and stuff, but he was like in a supermarket and the lady was passing like, you know, the little, the price of the, whatever he was buying and went, cheap. He goes, what is that? He didn't even know what a scanner at a supermarket was. He's a little out of touch, right? His dad was in the, you know, the president and, you know, and they're all CIA people or whatever. So I don't know if he's ever been to a grocery store before, you know, like government people are a little bit out of touch, wouldn't you say? So, so the locusts are coming, right? The servants come to him and Pharaoh and say, hey, why don't you just let the guys go? Haven't you seen it's been destroyed? Egypt is destroyed, verse 8. So Moses and Aaron uh, were brought again, uh, brought again to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve your, the Lord your God. Who are the ones going? Who are the ones that are going? And then Moses said, We will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds. We will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then he said to them, the Lord had better be with you when I let you and your little ones go. <laughs> he just loses it, doesn't he? See, what they had suggested to Pharaoh is you should let the men go, right? And they probably explained, you know, if the men go, they'll come back because they have to get their families and their flocks and stuff. So just let the men go. He says, you're going to what? And he says, so he says, not so in verse 11. Go now, you uh, who are men and serve the Lord for w- that is what you desired, and they were driven out of uh, out of from Pharaoh's presence. So Pharaoh again goes to compromise with them. Says the men can go, but none of the rest of them, because when I let when the little ones go and you go, you better watch out. It's it's not going to be good for you. Like basically, I'm going to kill you when that happens. And so. In verse 12, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over Egypt for the locusts that they may come up uh, upon the land and eat every herb of the land, all all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought on an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts and the locusts went up over the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt they were, uh, they were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them, for they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees nor on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt." So whatever the hail didn't get, the locusts ate up. And so with this plague of locusts, right, right, it's pretty messed up. And they ate all these things. In verse 16, it says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God against you. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin. He's really, really confessatory, isn't he? Please forgive my sin only this once, like one more time, and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt. So he gives, he's like, I'm serious this time. I've really sinned against you, and I won't ask you again, but please forgive me, and just make sure, could you go and pray to Yahweh and have him stop this thing? Do you ever feel like sometimes that that's how we've maybe been in the past with the Lord? Like, oh, if you just get me out of this, I'll never do that again. You know, like, play that game. He wasn't ready to truly repent. In verse 20, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the children of Israel go. So now we have the gods that were affected, Seth, the Ag God, and, and Isis, the Ag Goddess. Again, obviously, whatever was left over, they're like, see, Isis has brought up the wheat, you know, and see, you're like, 
and then all of a sudden it's all gone. <laughs> you know, like, it, 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 it didn't work out well for them. Now in verse 21, the ninth plague, darkness. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out the land toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings, right? No warning. The darkness came, right? They're unable to see. But the distinction is the children of Israel had light. In verse 24, then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. But Moses said, uh, You must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Uh, not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God. Even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. So, Moses, so Pharaoh sends Moses, right, to serve, but with another compromise, you need to leave your flocks and herds, right? Because then they'll have to come back. Plus, we don't have any, and maybe we'll just assume some of them to ourselves. I don't know what he's thinking. But you could take your little ones, right? We need our animals for sacrificing, right? Because we don't know when we get there what he's going to ask of us. Right? We're going to serve Yahweh that's doing this. Like, you know, so he's like taking this response. He's like, so when we get there, and he was be, speaking the truth, they did not know exactly what was required of them. It wasn't until they got to the wilderness at Sinai that they received the law and the Levitical sacrifices that were going to be given to them. Verse 27, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. The Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take heed to yourself and see my face no more, for in the day that you see my face, you shall die. So Moses said, you have spoken well. I will never see your face again. And so now again, Pharaoh's heart's hard, right? The Egyptian gods that were affected was the major one, Aton, the sun disc god, Horus, the winged sun disc god, Atum, god of the setting sun, right? You see, Pharaoh was the son of the sun gods, like, he was supposed to be kind of this, right? Not only the sun gods, but what? Thoth, the moon god, Shu, the sky, sky god, and Newt, the sky goddess. And so he's pretty much disassembled their whole pantheon. So real quick, let's just read through these. It's just the threat of the final plague, and next week we'll get into Passover. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on the Pharaoh on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. And when he lets you go, he will surely drive you out, here, out of here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver, articles of gold. And the Lord got, uh, gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land and in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of his people. So there's one more plague left now, right? You know, and then he's, when this goes down, Moses, Pharaoh's going to drive you out, right? And so what does he ask them? Hook me up, ask, your, ask people for, for, for gold and silver. Ask them for articles, right? And these articles would be, in Exodus 30, are the ones that are going to build up the tabernacle. Now, With this warning that's coming, right? Pharaoh's like, hey, you're not going to, I don't want to see your face anymore. And he says, fine, you don't have to see my face anymore. I'm going to be out of here. But there's one more plague that's going to come, right? And afterwards, you're going to send us out. And so as they're going to go out in verse 4, it says, Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out of the, into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. For the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn animals, then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, like uh, such was as not before it, nor shall it be like it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue, right? A dog's not going to even bark at him against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between Egyptians and Israel. 
And all of these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, and all the people who follow you. After that I will go out. Then he went out from Pharaoh in great anger, right? He gave the timing, which would be at midnight. Yahweh is going to make a distinction. The servants are going to come out, and you're going to send us out of here. Verse 9 and 10 says, But Moses said, uh, to, uh, then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and did not let the children of Israel go out of the land. Wonder what the big thing is, huh? Wonder what this final one is. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be awful. What, what would be the worst thing that could happen to Pharaoh? We'll find out next week. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would remind us, Lord, that you've pulled us out of the bondage of sin. And you came and you laid your life down as the Lamb of God so that we might go freely, Lord, but like these with the firstborn and the situation that's happening, Lord, just you are the true firstborn. You're the one that represents the true sacrifice, Lord, that you would die for our sins. And so we just thank you for that. May we give our lives in response to you giving yours. Lord, help us this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.